As I said earlier, we're, we're going, you're going to see everything on the uh, PowerPoint, especially the, the fill-in-the-blanks. There will be other uh, text as well. There will be Bible text too. Does not mean that I don't want you to bring your Bible. I, I want you to bring your Bible. It just means that I'm trying to make it a little easier by putting texts on the PowerPoint so that as we go through the sermons, you'll see that and, and, and maybe the Holy Spirit will, will help us um, to great, gain a greater knowledge when we see those texts. We might have a few glitches today. We're going to work that out eventually. The, the AV has been so kind. Brian, thank you so much. And Pastor Ben and Sabrina, I just met today, that, that uh, they're going to be clicking it for me today. Typically, I would click and move uh, the, the PowerPoint slides, but we're, we're going to work through this. So the book of Esther teaches us that God, God is at work in the details of our lives, even when he is unseen, because none of us have seen God. And the Lord Jesus' purpose is so that he would develop us. In other words, the Lord Jesus seeks for his people a greater purpose in this life and the life to come. And so I want to share with you four aspects that we're going to cover this morning. Four aspects that we will cover in the sermon outline that you will see, you will fill out if you so desire, uh, that we're going to cover. The first aspect that we're going to cover is the big picture. Because remember, this is an introduction sermon. Next week, we get into chapter 1. So the first aspect will be the big picture. What is the big picture about this book of Esther? This is an obscure book for some of us. It's, a, it's an Old Testament book that is right after, uh, what is it, Job, um, and right before Nehemiah. And some of us haven't gone through those dusty pages. So we're going to see the big picture. Secondly, we're going to ask, what's the big question about this book? Thirdly, there is a big idea. There is a big idea that the writer wants to convey to us about this book. And lastly, there is the big deal the big deal or the person who I might refer to as the big dog in this sermon, in this book called the book of Esther. Now, I like to have theme verses for uh, the sermon series that I preach. And so the theme verse might not be from that particular book. And this theme verse is not from the book of Esther. But I want to read it as you see it um, on, the, uh, on the screen. If you can put it up on the screen. There's the theme verse taken from Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our what? Instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. One of the greatest things that I get from God's word is hope. Hope. Not just because of the soon coming of Jesus, but hope to live in this world today. And so Paul tells us, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through the perseverance and the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope, and I hope that you will get more hope as you journey through with me in this spiritual journey through an obscure, what I consider an epic book called Esther. The story of Esther is one of divine guidance, but of divine grace and care for Esther's life and for our lives. You're going to see in this book of Esther as we go through this journey, it's amazing how you're going to see that God's grace was with his people then and God's grace is with his people now. Amen? Amen. So there are two Old Testament books which bear the names of women. One is Ruth. 
the Moabite foreigner who became a believer. And the other one is Esther, the Jewish girl who became a Persian queen. Now, I'm, I was thrilled to find out from Brian this week that he and his wife are Iranians. They're Persians. Amen? They're Persians. So I'm hoping that, that this will be a blessing to them, uh, I, but I'm also hoping that he's not going to make so many corrections on me uh, about this. But that's okay if he does. So those start to fill in the answers, as you see the underline, if you so desire to fill in your sermon outline. So our spiritual journey will be a fairly, in a fairly obscure book of the Old Testament, which is often neglected. It's often neglected because I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I tell you right now, before I started writing this sermon, I hadn't read too much about the book of Esther until I read through the Bible. And that was a number of years ago. So it's a fairly obscure book. And Esther's story begins with her Jewish name, Hadassah. One of the most famous hospitals, and Pastor Tony Moore, who's traveled a lot more in Israel than I have, will tell you the same thing. One of the most famous hospitals in the state of Israel is called Hadassah. And so her Hebrew name was Hadassah. But Esther's Persian name is Esther, and it means star. Hadassah means myrtle, and Esther means star. I want to give you just a little, just a little uh, uh, historical background. It was about 483 B.C., about 103 years after King Nebuchadnezzar had taken the Jews into captivity. If you remember your studies in Daniel, you remember that when Nebuchadnezzar went to basically uh, rid Israel and, and capture Israel, he took the best and the brightest young people, including Daniel, back to Babylon. And when he took them back to Babylon, it was with the intention of basically brainwashing them. Because you remember the three amigos, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Those aren't their Hebrew names. He gave them those Babylonian type of names. And so King Nebuchadnezzar at that time wanted to brainwash the best and the brightest that he brought from Israel to Babylon. And one of the ways to change or to bamboozle you, to brainwash you, is to change your name. And so you remember those three amigos, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were in that process because they were given different names. So Nebuchadnezzar did that in uh, 103 years after King Nebuchadnezzar had taken the Jews into captivity, according to 2 Kings uh, chapter 25, 54 years after Zerubbabel led the first group of exiles back to Jerusalem, according to Ezra, and 25 years before Ezra led the second group to Jerusalem. Esther, who we're going to be talking a lot about, lived in the kingdom of Persia, the dominant the mighty kingdom in the Middle East after Babylon's fall in 539. This kingdom was the dominant America. And it was from Persia all the way to the Mediterranean. Now Esther's parents must have been among those exiles who chose not to return back to Israel. Even though King Cyrus, the Persian king, issued a decree allowing the Jews to do so, perhaps because the Jewish exiles who preferred to stay in Persia were great entrepreneurs. They already established a life for themselves. And so they didn't want to go back. And Esther's parents were one of those. And we're going to see even a family member of Esther was the same way. Now, many Jews remi remained because they just had established themselves in Persia, as I said. They didn't want to go back to their homeland. They were successful entrepreneurs. They were successful living in Persia. But in our spiritual journey, we will see how the character of Esther imitates the character of Jesus. Jesus. 
Esther lost her parents, came from a foster home to a place of royalty. It's an epic story. And if you haven't read the book of Esther, this is going to be an incredible journey. Next slide, please. At God's appointed time, Esther revealed her true identity. But it was at God's appointed time, this young girl was filled with wisdom by her cousin Mordecai, who was probably around the age of 80. And she knew that she needed to listen to that wisdom. So at God's appointed time, she revealed her true identity and leveraged her position to save her people, the Jews. She was a type of Savior. At God's appointed time, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author of Esther reveals God's movements and his covenant relationship with his people. All through this book of Esther reveals how the hiddenness of God does not mean the absence of God. And I think that's important for us because as far as I know, none of us has seen God. And there are times when you feel, where is God? Is he hearing my prayers? But he's there. The king is the most widely recognized by his Greek name, Xerxes. His Persian name, Brian, I better let you handle that because I can't say that in Persian. From which was derived the Hebrew translation of Ahasuerus. Xerxes the Great was Persia's fifth king. And he was a proud and very impulsive king. So we get a little background now that King Xerxes is one of those main characters. Esther is one of only two books in the Bible that is named after a woman. Ladies? Wow, that's weak. <laughs> named after a woman. The other one, of course, as we know, is Ruth. In Ruth, we're given a glimpse of her domestic life in her village. Her life lived in the context of poverty, giving her life to God. But Esther is a total different story. Esther is not a life lived in poverty. Here in the book of Esther, we're at the entire opposite end of the social spectrum. We are taken into the grandeur and the extravagance of a royal palace that you will soon see in a few weeks. It's for that reason that I think the Bible is the most incredible book. Because if you take the time to read these books, you will relate to certain books. Ruth, a poor Moabite woman, and yet she's in there. Esther is in there, and she's a foreigner in a foreign country. With this book of Esther, we might begin by saying, once upon a time, there was a beautiful Jewish girl who became the queen of, of Persia. That's actually the story. It's kind of, if you think about it, a Cinderella story. Not quite rags to riches, but certainly a radical transformation in the life of this young Jewish girl. But you could put yourself in that, her position. A young American girl. This is an incredible epic story that we're going to go through. The story is set against the backdrop of an attempt led by one evil man. Now remember, this is an introduction. We will get to know this evil man a little more, unfortunately, because he's in the book. And his name was Haman. And he tried to exterminate the entire Jewish population from the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was from Persia all the way to the Mediterranean. I mean, it was a huge empire. The Persian Empire in ancient days was the greatest empire before the arrival of the Roman Empire. And King Xerxes ruled over this vast area from Persia to the Mediterranean Sea for some 200 years. But just so that you know, if you were studying the book of Daniel or Ezra or Nehemiah, then you would also discover that they all kind of relate to a particular time period as well as Esther in certain aspects and obviously to a certain geography as well. 
So the question for us today in 2024 is what relevance is there in spending our time living in the 21st century, digging into the events that took place two and a half thousand years ago in Persia or in modern day Iran? What is the relevance? The Bible is a relevant and practical book, and there is relevance. First, in your sermon outline, when we study any book of the Bible, and particularly one like this, we come to the book of Esther, it is important that we see the details in light of the big picture. Amen? As a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, we study the Bible in context. We don't take one verse out of context. You remember Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, you had Peter, and he was on a, on a rooftop, and he falls into this trance or this dream, and there's a, a sheet that comes down with these unclean animals. And in some of the versions of the Bible, it says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, as a good Jew, says, no, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. And most Christians stop there. And most Christians will say, see, you can eat pork. Because God, in words of red, said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we read the context. Amen? Amen? The beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter. Or maybe the chapter before and then the chapter after. Because if you remember the story and you go further down into verse 25 to 28, 29, Peter then goes into the house of a Gentile, Cornelius, and he says something like this. It was unlawful for me, a Jew, to be in the house of a Gentile. God has shown me that you're not unclean. It had nothing to do with being eating pork. It had to do that Peter was a racist. He was a racist. And God was showing him through the best analogy that a Jew would, you, would understand, through clean and unclean, animals period and so we read the bible in proper context okay so that's very important the details in light of the big picture because the events that are recorded in the bible are in the books of the bible because god wants them to be there paul who was once saul of tarsus writes to the roman christians and makes a point in romans 15:4 and that's our theme verse. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. God gives us these stories so that we will get hope, knowledge, wisdom, and most importantly, draw closer to Jesus Christ. Now we're going to study this book that has to do with this evil villain named Haman, a Jewish cousin and a Jewish cousin called Mordecai and a beautiful girl called Esther. And unfortunately, a very egotistical leader called King Xerxes. Those are the main characters as we cover this introduction. But before we delve into the details of this incredible book, what do we need to know? That there are evil characters in everyday life, even today. There are evil characters all around us. Through the Old and the New Testament, we will see those who are essentially seeking to do evil. And unfortunately, as many of us already know, we have a sinful human nature. For instance... Another evil character in the New Testament is, is a man named King Herod. And he did a very despicable thing because he wanted to slaughter all the babies in order to get rid of whom? Jesus. He was an evil character. Even though he blessed the Jews. Even though he did things that helped the Jews. But he was threatened by King Jesus. Jesus. 
Haman is another of those evil characters that we're going to see here in the book of Esther. What Haman is seeking to do is almost like what Herod did. Exterminate the lineage from which the Messiah Jesus would come. The one who would crush the serpent's head. So what we're going to see here in this journey through the book of Esther is the cosmic conflict. It's a type of a great controversy. And the great controversy, if you've read it, is between good and evil. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see between God and evil, sinful people. And so this evil, this cosmic conflict runs all the way through the story of Esther and the Jewish people. What is happening in the book of Esther is that God is preserving his people for it's out of those people that Jesus, our Messiah, is going to come. And this should be of encouragement for us. Because even in the world that we live in today, with all the evilness that goes on around us, God is telling Esther back then and, and the Jews back then, like he's telling us today, I will preserve you. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. I will watch over you. Lean on me. Let me be your rock. Therefore, he's going to make sure that in the details that appear on the canvas of God's word, he has his people protected. Why? Because as Jesus explained to the woman at the well, salvation is from the Jews, according to John 4.22. What was Jesus saying here regarding her question whether we worship God on Mount Gerizim as the Samaritans do or worship God in Jerusalem? And Jesus said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. God had a reason, a purpose, like he gives every one of us a purpose in this life. And the purpose was to save the Jews because salvation is from the Jews. Amen? Secondly, we are not only we not only need to get the big picture, but we need to face the big question. We'll see it briefly today, but nevertheless, we will see it more as we journey through the book of Esther. What is the big question? Well, if you haven't read the book of Esther, you probably wouldn't know. But as we journey through it, you are going to get an understanding. The question is, where is God in this book? Because if you remember reading through the book of Esther, the name of God doesn't show up. It's not there. But this is an epic book. How can God's name not be in this book? How can God not have had the writer put the Lord, God, Yahweh, something? Where is God in this book? Because Esther is not simply only one of two books written about women. It's also one of two books which has no mention of the name of God. And the second book that has no mention of God is, anybody know? It's a book that I have never preached from, and I don't want to preach from it, actually. It's the Song of Solomon. Because it has a lot of... Uh, uncomfortable things as a pastor to preach through. <laughs> you can read it. Matter of fact, if you're a newlywed, it might be the best book to read when you get married. Because it's in a rock. It's an interesting book. It's a very interesting book. The Song of Solomon and the Book of Esther. There's a reason that God did not have his name put in this book. And I hope as we journey through this book, we will realize the unseen God. Because sometimes when we're in the work week and our boss is yelling at us, And things aren't going well. 
and we're hurting and we're scratching ourselves thinking, God, where are you? He's there. He's there. He's the unseen God. Perhaps the reason the name of God is not in the book of Esther is because he just didn't want it to be. And maybe it's a, a faith issue. Maybe he didn't put his name in this book because he wants you to grow in faith and he wanted you to see how he protected, preserved his people in Esther's day. If all of the events of the Old Testament are in the Old Testament, it's because God wanted them and intended them to be there. Therefore, if God's name is not, does not appear in the book of Esther, it's because for some reason... God in his infinite wisdom did not want it or need it to be appear or appear in this book. But why would God not want his name to appear in the book then? Maybe to teach us. Maybe to teach us that the events of life when God is apparently absent, he's not. He's not absent. You might think he is, but he's a prayer away. I think Ellen White says something like, praying to God is like praying to your friend. Amen? He's just a prayer away. The power is there. But just because we can't see him, or just because his name doesn't show up, does not, does not mean that he's not there. He is the omnipresent God. And in this unfolding story of life, God is in the details. God, as it has been said, working his purpose out in our lives. And one thing that I get from Esther is that he gave Mordecai, he gave Esther, he gave the different characters a purpose. And he gives all of us a purpose in life. One of the things that makes it clear is this. That God is not only present in the passage of the Red Sea, in the crossing of the J Jordan, or in the calming of the waters, but God is present in the struggles of everyday life and in everyday events of life. He's working his purpose out, even if he's not seen. God, although his name doesn't appear in the book at all, is present. And we're going to see that in, in our journey together. He is definitely present. We'll see as we read through this story that God is at work in the refusal of a Persian queen to her husband's demands. And we'll start seeing that next week with Queen Vashti. It's amazing how she disobeyed the king. And you don't do that in that time, in that era. It's a great story because the Lord is actually overruling the hatred of of an evil man named Haman. But it doesn't mean that God pre-programmed him to hate. Not at all. Haman displays the hatred of Mordecai and the Jewish people because of his sinful human nature. And you can see that in the world around us. In all the wars, in all the trouble spots, it's our sinful human nature that we unfortunately inherited now perhaps God leaves the name out of the book of Esther so that the moment that we look into Esther's journey, we say, wow, that is a God thing. That can only be God. Because when God appears to be most absent in your life, he's actually desiring to be present and working in your life to help you develop a character like Jesus. Amen? Because he wants all of us to have that character of Jesus Christ. We've seen the big picture, the big question. Now third, the big idea. What's the big idea? Well, the big idea is God's providence. A theological word that broken down is when God does what he wants, when he wants. That's God's providence in a very simple definition. God does what he wants when he wants. And then God's sovereignty is his ability to be able to do what he wants because he's God. He's sovereign. I'm not God, but he is. 
and he can choose to do what he wants in his providence when he wants because he knows it's going to help his children. You see, nothing happens except through God and by his will. That's the big idea that runs all the way through the book of Esther. That nothing good happens except through the Lord. Now one way in which the secular mindset has made inroads into the Christian church is through the worldview that assumes everything happens according to a fixed natural cause. And God, if he, is actu- if he actually exists, is above and beyond it all what happens on earth. Historically, however, Christians have had an awareness that this is our Father's world. Our Father's world and that the affairs of people and the nations in the final analysis are in God's hands. Because it's His world. That's why Paul said in Romans 8.28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. This is the knowledge of God and His divine providence. You see, God never fails to meet his children's, his people's needs. For example, when God knew that his people were facing starvation, there's this beautiful story that he gives us in the book of Genesis. He uses a young man named Joseph. And what a strange way to get Joseph in such a power position that Joseph brags to his brothers, And his brothers are not happy about that. He brags so much to them, you know the story, that they begin to hate their little brother. And they sold him into slavery and want him to be put in a pit. But ultimately, Joseph becomes the right-hand man of the Pharaoh. Ultimately, when there is a famine, who saves his family from starvation. Joseph. It's an amazing story. It ended up with Joseph saying this, you, meaning his family, intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Joseph was a savior to his brothers and his family. Esther becomes that way to the Jewish people. It's an amazing story. What was Joseph doing? He was fulfilling a divine plan, a unified plan for all of history. Lastly, the big deal. King Xerxes thinks he is the big deal, he's the big man, the big dog. But ultimately, he becomes the big dud. As we draw to a close this morning, Esther, and remember, this is the introduction, Esther becomes queen. She's in a position of influence now. Her cousin Mordecai says to her, Esther, you have a real opportunity on your hands to get us, the Jews, in Persia, out of a life and death situation. Esther, this is her 80-year-old cousin speaking to his cousin that's younger, beautiful, and now the queen. Esther chapter 4 verse 12 says, when Mordecai received Esther's message, verse 13, he sent her this warning. Don't imagine that you are safer than any other Jew just because You are in the royal palace. You see, the edict or the law had been issued for the extermination of all Jews. It was curtains. They were going to be killed a year later, murdered. So Mordecai says, I know you're the queen, but but don't you think for a minute that just because you're in there with the king that you will not be subjected to this because he's implying to her, you're Jewish too. To what? Verse 14. 
if you keep quiet, Esther, at this time like this, help will come from heaven to the Jews and they will be saved. But you will die and your father's family will come to an end. Yet who knows, maybe it was for a time like this that you were made queen. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. In other words, God will look after his people. Amen? Amen. 2,500 years ago, in 2024, God is saying, all the chaos that's happening in the world around us, God will look after you. We just have to remain faithful. And here's the question. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You see, Mordecai implies, Esther, this is the reason that you exist on this planet. That your whole life, everything that's happened, that God gave you this DNA, that he made you wise and beautiful. He made you desirable among all the other potential women to replace Queen Vashti. A Jewish girl. And you were made for just this time. Maybe, maybe it was for a time like this that you were made queen. First, it's important to see the big, the, the, the details in the big picture of Esther. Secondly, the big question, there's no doubt that God is present in the book of Esther as well as in our lives, even if his name never shows up. Thirdly, the big idea we see that God's providence. Lastly, as we close this morning, the big deal or the big dog becomes the big dud. Why? Because God is ultimately in control. Amen? God is ultimately in control. And as we go through this book of Esther, we're going to discover that God is placing his people, you and I, in the right spot for the right task at the right moment in these last days of earth's history. But Jesus needs us to have a character like him. And he was molding Esther for just the right time. In our spiritual journey through the book of Esther, we'll see God behind the scenes. Because God's purpose is such that nothing escapes his notice. Nothing happens without his knowledge. Even the worst things that will happen to us in our lives can turn out ultimately for our good. And how do I know that? And we know that all things work together for good. We know that all things work together for good for, the, for those who what? Who what? Who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from what? Church, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for this incredible, epic book. We've only touched the surface. We've only scratched the surface with this introduction. But we do know that you are behind the scenes, even in our lives. You saved a young Jewish girl to replace Queen Vashti for a reason, for a purpose. And everyone here has a purpose that you have given them. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that in our spiritual journey in these next 10 chapters, that you will grow us, that you will help us to be able to know without a doubt that because we can't see you, you're there. 
may we be able to share this good news. The good news that Jesus exists and that Jesus has given us a purpose in this life and the life to come. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen.